September ends the way it started. With the gaze of the college football world on South Bend. This time, it's a top 10 showdown. It'll be a good lives, sir. In the glow of prime time. It's going to be a legend. Nights like this one are why they work so hard. Touchdown, Notre Dame! Nights like this one are why we fell in love with this grand old game. Saint, did he catch it? Yes! Nights like this one, well, they're what dreams are made of. These are the moments that you wait for. Moments that could become memories we share for decades. We're an hour away from witnessing history. And we're here to count down the minutes with you. Live under the lights of Notre Dame Stadium, this is New Center 16's Countdown to Kickoff. A buzz crackles through the crisp early autumn air as the Notre Dame campus comes alive. Tonight, tens of thousands have made the pilgrimage here for the fourth time this season. But this one is bigger than all the rest. And now you are looking live inside the house that Rockney built. Number seven, Stanford and Notre Dame will meet here. And how big is this one? It is the first time these two have met with both teams undefeated since The Rock himself led the Irish when they beat Stanford in the 1925 Rose Bowl. And with that, we welcome you to New Center 16's Countdown to Kickoff. I'm Alex Wilcox. And I'm WHME Sports Director Chuck Freeby. These two teams could not have been here any differently. A new Irish QB woke up the offense and put Wake Forest to bed early last week, while the Cardinal, well, they needed every last second and more to break some duck hearts. Two distinct paths, just one of the many reasons that make tonight's clash so alluring. Alex, we have so many storylines. In fact, I can't remember a Notre Dame football game where you had as many storylines as this one does. You've got the running back situation that we'll delve into. Of course, you've got the quarterback situation. You've got David Shaw's mastery mm -hmm. of Brian Kelly. And oh, by the way, yes, Ian Book. Ian Book. How can we not talk about him? It's the story of not just this week, but last week as well, and really of the entire season of the Notre Dame quarterback situation. Brandon Wimbush goes 3-0 and and leads Notre Dame to a number eight ranking, but the Irish looks a little sluggish, doesn't really get that identity. So Brian Kelly makes the call to go to Ian Book. They explode for 56 points, but my question really is, is Book that good, or did he just beat up on a bad weight defense? Well, isn't that the question we've had, because Ian Book's two starts have come against North Carolina and Wake Forest, mm -hmm. and Sims hold back water better than those two teams <laughs> hold back offenses. So tonight, you face a Stanford team that's pretty good defensively, the question will be, how will Book do on this stage? And it also leads to the question about momentum. Because the Irish have some with Ian Book at quarterback, but Stanford would seem to have a lot after that come from behind what Oregon would call a debacle yeah. last week. That was an incredible win for Stanford. Down 17 points. It looks like they may be down 31 to 7, and then they get that uh, scoop and score late. They force overtime, and then to win it in overtime in Eugene when they're down so much, you're taking a look at some of the highlights now. That's got to give them so much confidence heading into this game. It shows that not only can they beat good teams, but they can go on the road, walk into your house, and walk out with a big win. I just wonder if two straight road games, and this one three time zones away, mm -hmm. eventually takes its toll on the Cardinal. While the Irish get to come home here to the stadium, with the new quarterback and all the momentum that came off that. But you brought up a good point earlier today about Notre Dame playing in this stadium. And it hasn't been good for the Irish this year. They've struggled at home. Meanwhile, this series, Notre Dame and Stanford, you know what's happened the last three years. The Cardinal have beaten the Irish. And in two of those games, Notre Dame has frittered away big leads. Two years ago here at the stadium, Deshaun Kaiser throws a pick six. Stanford comes roaring back. Last year, Notre Dame became Catholic Charities in the fourth <laughs> quarter, just giving stuff away everywhere, and the Cardinal wound up winning big. But you also have to remember that uh, 20, 2016 game was in the middle of their 4-8 and eight season. That was a debacle on 
every front. But before that, when you think about the other games here at Notre Dame Stadium, 2014 and 2012, 2014, the Irish won in dramatic fashion with a Ben Koyak touchdown with just a minute left to win it. And then, of course, who could forget the incredible finish in 2012 Notre Dame and Stanford going into overtime. They win it on a goal line stand with the rain pouring down at Notre Dame Stadium to keep their undefeated season alive. Yeah, and a freshman, Alex Wilson, nearly took out our producer running onto the field. <laughs> with those recent showdowns with Stanford fresh on your minds, let's take a look at tonight's Lock Monday Auto Group Irish fan poll on WNU.com. We want to know, is Stanford now one of Notre Dame's biggest rivals? Right now, a majority of you, 59% say yes, 41% aren't buying it, they say no. There's still plenty of time to vote in the Lock Monday Auto Group Irish Fan Poll on WNDU.com, and we'll have the final results for you during the last few minutes of the countdown. A key member of the Irish offense will not play tonight. Running back Jafar Armstrong is out. Our friend Tim Priester from Irish Illustrated broke the news last night. A left knee infection will keep Armstrong off the field. The Irish certainly will miss him. Jafar has 245 yards rushing. He's averaging 5.2 yards a carry, and he scored five touchdowns this season. But there is some positive running back news tonight. Dexter Williams is set to make his season debut, though never officially acknowledged by Brian Kelly. Williams was suspended the first four games of the season. Now out of the doghouse, Dexter has the chance to provide a jolt to the Irish offense. Kelly says Williams is better at all facets of the game than he was in the spring. So Williams, leading rusher Tony Jones Jr. and Avery Davis all pick up the running slack from Armstrong. And there's another pretty good runner on the Irish bench by the name of Brandon Wimbush. We, we definitely might see him tonight as well. We're just getting started on the countdown. Up next, to check on the mood outside in the tailgating lot. Plus, Notre Dame has so many traditions we all hold dear. A look at the origins of some of the most popular ones, whether you're learning about them for the first time or just need a refresher. And here's your first Subway trivia test of the evening. When was the last top 10 matchup at Notre Dame Stadium? And what was the result? The answer when the countdown rolls back in two minutes. Here is your Subway Trivia answer. The last top 10 matchup at Notre Dame Stadium was one of the most memorable college football games in recent memory when the number nine Irish hosted number one USC on October 15th, 2005. The game capped a frenzied couple of days on campus and lived up to all the hype. The teams traded the lead back and forth all afternoon long and into the evening, and it of course had one of the most controversial endings ever when Matt Leinert snuck into the end zone courtesy of the Bush push, giving the Trojans a 34-31 win. Back on the countdown with a check on the mood of the Irish faithful today and some of their traditions over the decades. The countdown's Jen Cardone and Lindsay Stone are both out on campus with Irish fans tonight. Lindsay has the background on some of those Irish customs so many cherish. But let's start with you, Jen. What's the atmosphere? Well, I think I know, but go ahead and tell me. What's it like right now on campus? I, I can barely hear you. It's electric. It's exciting. And these two guys just got engaged. Just a few minutes ago, let's just say the tradition of loving the Irish goes on for generations, just like I saw earlier on campus at the tailgate. Let's go Irish! Let's go Irish! Woo! The Stanford fans have been great. We're happy to be here. We're happy to be here too. Great Irish fans, great Stanford fans. It'll be a great game. Basilica, if you get engaged at the Notre Dame football game. Now we go from today's mood across campus to some of the reasons those fans fell in love with the Irish in the first place. Lindsay Stone has that part of the story, and Lindsay, whether fans know everything about the blue and golds or are just novices, you've got them covered. 
Alex, that is exactly right. 11 national championships, seven Heisman Trophy winners, and 101 All-Americans. These are just a few of the many accomplishments of Notre Dame football. This university and this team is built on so much tradition. But we all know to really understand this team, it's about understanding its history. Lou Holtz took over as head football coach in 1986. He had seen a picture in a book someplace where that sign had existed. The sign was only seen by players and coaches until 1991, when NBC began televising Irish home games. They put a lipstick camera up at the top of the stairwell, and so all of a sudden millions of people knew what Play Like a Champion was all about. You can't think about Notre Dame without thinking of gold. Every Friday night before each home game, the helmets would be spray painted by the student managers. People would even bring things that they wanted painted because the gold paint included gold leaf from the gold dome. That tradition now just a fond memory, no longer needed with the modern golden helmets, but another piece of Irish heritage that still glows bright. Bob O'Brien, who is our former band director, decided that Notre Dame should have something unique. Brian met with designers, picking out colors and a pattern that would be unlike anything anyone had ever seen. He even flew to Scotland to have a plaid registered to become Notre Dame plaid. You see the plaid on the kilts of the Irish Guard? That's just not an accidental piece of cloth. <laughs> The Hesburgh Memorial Library was built in the early 60s, and along with it, one of the most photographed places on campus. A lot of it had to do with the proximity to the stadium because it looked directly towards the football stadium. You would hear people referring to it as Touchdown Jesus based on the way his arms were raised. And you can't talk about traditions without talking about the father of Notre Dame football. We're going inside him. We're going outside him. Inside him, outside him. And when we get him on the run once, we're going to keep him on the run. This is the 100th anniversary of Newt Rockney's first season as head coach at Notre Dame. Rockney led the Fighting Irish to three national championships, 105 victories, and posted the highest all-time winning percentage for a major college football coach. His presence is everywhere. He was such a groundbreaker in so many ways. Tonight, the Fighting Irish take on Stanford in the house that Rockney built, pushing towards another victory, while not forgetting where they came from. And Notre Dame played its first football game back in 1887. And a hundred years ago, the national following began when Rockney took over. And since then, this team has continued to build on that tradition and take pride in its strong heritage. Guys? In fact, Lindsay, 100 years ago today, New Rockney's first game as coach. Wow, how about that? That's got to be a good omen for Notre Dame. You, you would think. think. Thing. <laughs> well, thank you, Lindsay. We're just a quarter of the way into the countdown with so much more left to bring you. You folks have already had me straighten my tie, change my clipboard. Up next, it's our Irish Illustrated Report with Tim O'Malley. We'll talk about Ian Book's first test on a huge stage, plus the story that Irish Illustrated broke. Jafar Armstrong out tonight with a knee injury. And you can subscribe to Irish Illustrated, the number one source for Notre Dame sports online. Just head to irishillustrated.com and click on join to find the best plan for you. Back with our Irish Illustrated report, Tim O'Malley joins us. Tim, let's start with the story Tim Priester broke last night, Jafar Armstrong's injury. How did the Irish respond? You know, I think they were really planning on using Armstrong to complement the Jones-Williams backfield at this point. Uh, Jafar Armstrong's having a great year, but he is the one of the three that can really get in that slot and do some damage downfield. So I think they're going to miss it more than most fans believe because everyone's kind of welcoming back Dexter Williams. Yeah. But the plan was to get all three of them in, and I, I really think it means Avery Davis still kind of has to be acclimated into playing, but I think they were loaded to go with Williams, Armstrong, and Jones, so it, it could be a problem. Everyone wants to know about the quarterback situation. We expect Ian Book to start tonight. Now, his two other starts in his career, Wake Forest and North Carolina, not exactly the type of test he'll see tonight. Do you think he has what it takes to handle this atmosphere, but also that Stanford defense? I do, but I don't believe it's going to be a 25, 34, 325 yards, no interceptions. I think when you're going against defense like Stanford, they're confusing fronts. They really do make Notre Dame turn the ball over kind of historically over the last six, seven years of the Shaw era. He'll have a mistake or two, but I would be surprised if Ian Book doesn't play well tonight. you got to remember, 
he has gone against a better defense than this, albeit in relief, in LSU last year. So I, I do think Ian Book will play well. Uh, I don't think he's going to be perfect this time, though. Fans focus on quarterbacks, but there's another sizable change on the Irish offense, and that's at guard. What does Trevor Rulin give this offense that Tommy Kramer didn't? I think a little bit of mobility to get out there and pull, but also he kind of gives them a healthy ankle. Uh, Tommy Kramer probably didn't play because his ankle wasn't up to it. I think you, according to Brian Kelly, you'll see them both. That would mean that Kramer is healthy, but I do think that they will rotate a little bit, kind of like they did last year at right tackle. Well, Brian Kelly says we'll see everybody <laughs> both. <laughs> They're all ready to go. <laughs> Going back to the quarterbacks now on the other side. Last year, KJ Costello yeah. just picked apart Notre Dame. What is it about his game that makes him so dangerous? Uh, I, I do think he's poised under pressure, but I think what makes him dangerous is he's got the guy Bryce Love behind him, yeah. and he has some massive, talented wide receivers, J.J. Arceda, Whiteside. You know, they, they bring size and strength, but they're savvy. They know how to use that size and strength. We kind of talked about Michigan's tight ends, how they could be a problem. This is a much different animal. That Stanford really knows how to use its size. Whiteside with seven touchdowns, and then Colby Parkinson, 6-7, uses all of it with three in the red zone. It's it's a tough matchup. Game prediction time. Yeah, you know, I was going back over the series with David Shaw. Do you know the last time Notre Dame stopped Stanford from scoring in the red zone? 2012. 2012 goal line to stand. win at the goal line stand. So they're going to have to come up with something. It's been 15 touchdowns and three field goals and 18 trips since. I think this pass rush is up to it, and I do think Notre Dame pulls out a really close one. I would never bet against Stanford playing a great game here. I'm in that 28 27, another classic in South Bend between the two. And you can subscribe to Irish Illustrated, the number one source for Notre Dame sports online. They just break stories every Friday. Just head to irishillustrated.com, click on join to find the best plan for you. Up next, scouting Stanford. The Cardinal have a ton of weapons to watch out for. What their smug coach says they have to do if they want to win here tonight with a countdown returns in two minutes. Back with scouting Stanford as Notre Dame welcomes in a Cardinal team that very well may be the toughest on the Irish schedule. The Cardinal are 4-0. They're ranked 7th in the country. They're coming off last week's incredible comeback win in overtime against Oregon and Eugene. Stanford has also beaten Notre Dame three straight years, though they've never won four in a row against the Irish. The Cardinal boasts the electrifying Heisman candidate Bryce Love, a running back a host of talented receivers, and a quarterback in K.J. Costello, who's quietly becoming one of the best in college football. After last week's slow start, Stanford head coach David Shaw says the key for his team is to come out firing and take the crowd out of the game. And there's going to be an adjustment period. There'll be an adjustment period this, this week at Notre Dame. You would love for that adjustment period to be half of a quarter, you know, the first couple of drives on both sides of the ball before you settle down, and not two and a half quarters. So that's the key. Um, to get everybody, everybody settled and just executing um, at a high level and dealing with when you're on the road against a really good team, you're going to get their best shots. They're going to come out swinging and the crowd's going to be on their side and you have to be able to deal, deal with that. From Stanford coach David Shaw now to buy or sell on the countdown. All right, first bid up. Dexter Williams gets at least 10 carries tonight. Dexter spent a long time in the doghouse, and I don't know what kind of game shape that he's in yet. Uh, yes, the, uh, the injury to Jafar Armstrong sways this a little bit, but I yeah. think you need the physical Tony Jones. I'm going to sell on that one. I, I don't think he's quite at 10. I'm actually going to buy this one. Originally, we had said eight carries as the over-under. We bumped it up to 10 when we heard about uh, Jafar's injury. With Jafar out, it's Tony Jones and it's Dexter Williams. Maybe maybe Brandon Wimbush gets a couple carries. I'm buying that one. Ian Book starts the remainder of the games for the Irish. Buy or sell? Look, when Coach Kelly compares you to Joe Montana and Baker Mayfield, you better start the rest of the season. I'm buying that one. Well, Montana came off the bench a lot. <laughs> uh, Baker Mayfield got suspended. I'm still buying. I think that Ian Book is the flavor right now that Brian Kelly wants on his team. All right, tonight's winner, huge game. Tonight's winner runs the table. Well, if Stanford wins, they still have a big road game at Washington, yeah. which is ranked number 11. That's coming up in November. If Notre Dame wins, 
They have a Syracuse team who looked really good today at Yankee Stadium. They have to go to the Coliseum, where I know USC hasn't looked good, but Clay Helton's still undefeated at the Coliseum. I'm selling that. And they've got a huge test at Blacksburg next week. I, I know Virginia Tech lost their starting quarterback, but maybe that's another letdown game. If they get another uh, big win tonight, I'm selling it. Well, how about tonight's winner makes the college football playoff? You know, maybe I'm just a pessimist. I'm, I'm still selling that. I think Notre Dame's schedule is still difficult. Even if they win tonight, I, I, think, uh, I think they still need to do and, more. And the Pac-12 gets no respect yeah. either, so I, I would sell on that as well. All right, up next, two of the most talented guys you'll see on the field tonight share an endearing surname. I'll show you why Stanford's Bryce and Notre Dame's Julian each have Cardinal and Irish hearts of flutter. It's a love connection when the countdown comes back in two and two. David Sean is number seven Stanford Cardinal returned to Notre Dame Stadium for their biennial visit. The stakes have never been higher in their matchups with the Irish and the boys from Palo Alto have their eyes heading back to the farm with a signature win for their resumes. But Brian Kelly and his number eight Irish have resume building plans of their own. A resurgent offense has many across Notre Dame land dreaming big, really big. And they all know the first step to make those dreams come true is knocking off the Cardinal tonight. Back inside the countdown with WHME Sports Director Chuck Freeby, I'm Alex Wilcox. The Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Tina Turner was never widely regarded as a football analyst, Alex, but she once asked the musical question, what's love got to do with it? Well, in this game, no matter which side you're on, the answer is quite a bit. The Beatles opined all you need is love, and last year Stanford's offense agreed. Cardinal tailback Bryce Love ran for over 2,100 yards, and he's averaged over seven yards per carry for his career. What makes him so good? His cutting ability, he fakes it inside and tries to beat your outside. His ability to accelerate and his ability to uh, make defenders miss in tight spaces, uh, kind of what makes him unique. Try to li limit the solo tackles on him, because I mean, he's, that's what he specializes in, I making mean, one cut, making people miss. He should know he's the other All-American love in this game, Irish cornerback Julian Love. Tonight, he's likely to pass Clarence Ellis and become Notre Dame's all-time leader in pass breakups. But he also knows he has his hands full, not just with Bryce Love, but with Stanford's tall receiving core. They definitely have height on me and on some of our DBs, but um, it's just a matter of being physical, a matter of using technique, uh, leverage, and everything that they're trying to gain, we're trying to take away and make him play left-handed. Sorry Bon Jovi, but neither player gives Love a bad name. Tonight, which one can channel their inner Steve Winwood and bring a higher love? I'm, I'm taking J-Love all day. The two-day love, you know, the best love guy I know. I think our love is the best in the country, to be honest. And as for Julian, after two years of losing, he's taking a page from Taylor Swift and hoping this love story has a different ending. Taking it on himself to come back um, for the season for his team, I mean, it's, it's special of him. And so, I mean, I'm just going to compete to those my ability and showcase my last name. Julian says the biggest jealousy he has of Bryce Love is that he wears number 20. That's the number Julian wore in high school. But with these two stars on the field, tonight you could certainly rename Notre Dame Stadium the Love Shack. And from the Love Shack to Purcell Pavilion, where our next guest hopes to enjoy another fruitful season this year. It's Irish men's head basketball coach Mike Bray back on the countdown. How much does an atmosphere like the one we're experiencing tonight help you and your team uh, with recruiting? No, it, it, these football weekends, and of course, Chuck, we've had four out of five. Right. It's exhausting for all of us. <laughs> but to bring a family in and a prospect in in this atmosphere, the energy's great. Our guys played pickup today in the arena, and people are coming from tailgating and cheering them on. Fabulous. It's got me excited for practice on Monday. As you said, practice starts on Monday. Yeah. You guys had a nice foreign tour to the Bahamas over the summer. What are your expectations this year? You know what? We really have a shot of getting back to the NSA tournament. We just missed last year. That was frustrating because yeah. we were regular visitors. Our young guys have to grow up, but they're gifted enough to do that. And as you mentioned, the Bahamas helped us. It gave us a jump start on it. I've got to be patient with them. 
But our young guys know how to play, and then you have a guy like Fluger and Gibbs, Mooney and Burns, who've been around a little bit. They have to lead for us. This is as ballyhooed a freshman class as I can remember you having. Who are some of those freshmen that might make an immediate contribution? Well, there's no question Prentice Hub, the point guard from D.C., is back from the ACL injury. He's healthy. We're going to need him to handle the ball for us, especially with the loss of Matt Farrell. Dane Goodwin was Mr. Basketball in Ohio, an athletic wing guard. That's Robbie Carmody we're watching right now from Pittsburgh, Mr. Basketball in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He'll play for us. Uh, Nate Lashevsky, a stretch four man, a shooter from Northfield, Mount Hermon. Those four guys are really ready to help us, as is Jawan Durham, the transfer from Connecticut. Five new faces for our fans to see. They haven't seen them yet. And you guys are moving into some new digs pretty we soon. Are. Just yeah. uh, having that new facility, what does that do for your well, program? Well, it's a shot in the arm. It really shows a commitment to basketball here. I know Muffin and I are both very excited. We may be able to get on the practice courts next week, which is exciting. It certainly helps recruiting, but it helps our culture. We have four-year guys that work and work on their game. It's a better laboratory for them, a Bonzi, a Matt Farrell, uh, a Jack Cooley, uh, for those guys to get better over four years. So I'm excited to get into it. We should be in it all the way in mid-November. All right, Coach. Thanks so much for good joining us and good you. luck this good season. Good to be with you guys. Absolutely. Well, there's still a whole lot left to bring you on the countdown. Up next, Irish tight end Nick Wisher carries an incredible inspiration with him every time he steps on the field and everywhere else he goes in life. We share his story. And here's another Subway trivia question. When was the last top 10 showdown in prime time at Notre Dame Stadium? And what was the result? The answer when the countdown returns in two minutes. Here is your Subway trivia answer. You have to go back more than 28 years for the last top 10 showdown in prime time here at Notre Dame Stadium when the number one Irish hosted number four Michigan September 15, 1990. Goshen's own Rick Meyer made his first college start that evening and he rallied his Irish to a fourth quarter comeback and a 28-24 win over the maize and blue. Adrian Gerald with the touchdown catch, now to a member of the Irish offense, impacting lives both on and off the field. Brian Kelly says Nick Wisher means more than just an average football player. And while he isn't a captain, he still acts like he has a C on his chest. We bring in the countdowns, Mark School Jr. And Mark, Nick just has an incredible inspiration that he carries with him every day. That's right, guys. Nick Wisher suffered an unthinkable personal loss and has used that as his own inspiration on the field, but is also helping so many others. Here come the Irish. Before every game at Notre Dame Stadium, Nick Wisher runs through the tunnel to the south end zone where he gets on a knee to say a prayer. I pray to God and I pray, um, you know, to Andrew to kind of watch over me. Nick's older brother, Andrew, has had a huge impact on his life. Andrew is the reason Nick started playing football. When he was in high school, I went to all of his games and um, just to have that, that role model and that to, to way, the, the way he played was, you know, just a tough, gritty player. Just uh, always doing his job, you know, you can always count on him. So from an early age, I tried to emulate that. But eight years ago, Nick's role model was diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Two years later, Andrew lost his fight. He was just 21. I think about him daily, just everything I do on the field. I think that stems from him and kind of the lessons he taught me. The most important lesson Nick learned from Andrew was to never give up. Cut for the Nick Wisher touchdown. His kind of big, big deal was, you know, when he was getting hospice care, uh, he looked the nurse in the eye and told her, I'm not done fighting. So um, for me to, to be able to come out in the field and have that I'm not done fighting attitude is a big deal for me. To the back of the end zone, Wisher, touchdown, Notre Dame. That mentality resonates throughout the entire Notre Dame football program. He is a, a um, very influential player on our football team. And when he makes plays, it's, it sends you know a real positive feeling amongst our football team. He's a guy you want in your foxhole. Mm -hmm. um, just a great guy, and you know, through the thick and thin, he'd be there for you. But Nick is there for more than just his teammates. His family created the Andrew Wisher Foundation to fulfill Andrew's dying wish, to bring joy and ease the financial burden felt by families battling cancer. One of the foundation's big events is Wish Fest, 
a one-night musical festival in Chicago. Every single dollar raised by Wishfest goes to a family who needs it. It's just the fact that you know the foundation is giving to other people, and that's what you know my brother asked us to do. So it's really, um, you know, I wouldn't think twice about it. You know, it's not something like that. I, I feel like I'm, you know, courageous for for doing it or whatnot. It's just something that I feel like we were we were called to do. Touchdown, Nick Wisher. While the Wisher family is helping others. Nick says Andrew is helping him. There's certain times, especially you feel like you have a little extra help, and I do believe that you know that's a guardian angel and you know God and Andrew for sure working in my life. When you feel that extra presence, um, it's it's really cool. It's a really special experience, and I hope uh, everyone can feel that at some point. Chuck and Alex, the foundation has raised nearly eight hundred thousand dollars, and through that hard work. Nick earned himself a nomination for the Capital One Courage Award given to a college football player who best displays that trait both on and off the field. He's truly an incredible guy. I've gotten to work with him when I worked uh, on the team as, as a manager. One of the best guys, treats everyone with respect, means so much to all of his teammates and even more to his family. Great and story. And family <laughs> turning a negative into a huge positive for so many others. Yeah. And Wishfest is coming up December 1st, right around the corner. Coming up at Sportsbeat on the countdown, Darren Pritchett joins us with impressions of Ian Book and what he expects from Book tonight. Plus, where does tonight's atmosphere rank with other big games in Notre Dame Stadium? His take when the countdown returns in two minutes. Back with Sports Beat on the Countdown and our regular visit from the host of Weekday and Game Day Sports Beat, Darren Pritchett joins us once again. All right, Darren, let's start with tonight's atmosphere. I was expecting a little more like Michigan. I kind of don't feel it tonight. It is a different feel tonight. Yeah. When I came down here, I was expecting some electricity, but it's very, very quiet. I don't know if there's tension in the air mm -hmm. because I think everybody feels like Notre Dame needs to win this game to stay in the playoff hunt. If you lose this game, the schedule coming up, you wonder if there's going to be enough juice to help your strength of schedule. The question says your impressions of Ian Book, but I don't think you do impressions. But what do you <laughs> expect from him tonight? Well, I expect him to run the RPOs very well, the run pass options. It's funny watching him last week and thinking back to watching Chip Long video from his days at Memphis. Yeah. That kind of looked like the offense from Memphis that did some big things. He gets rid of the ball on time. He was very accurate against Wake Forest, but I bet you Stanford will have a little more tighter coverage than Wake Forest. You think? <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little bit. So the Irish, you would assume if they want to win today, they got to be able to run the ball. We learned last night Jafar Armstrong out, Dexter Williams in. What effect do those two moves have on the Irish offense? I love Jafar's versatility. He's running the ball better with the pads down, but he's also so good coming out of the backfield or lining him up as a wide receiver. A great dual threat for this offense. Dexter hasn't played in a while. His career high is eight carries in a game. So I'm not sure how much we're going to see him today, but obviously with Jafar out, that's going to force Dex to be on the field, maybe a little more than the coaches won in that first game back. We had this question in the Emmy Award winning segment by herself. Does tonight's winner make the college football playoff? It's just too early. It's September. Oh, come on. It's too early. I mean, <laughs> I'll say it again. If Notre Dame loses this game, you lose to the best opponent on your schedule on your home field that's probably a contender. And with the strength of schedule, we thought Florida State was going to be good. Northwestern, they're playing better today. But there's a lot of teams that aren't playing up to the level we thought. Virginia Tech. So where's the strength of schedule going to come from? down the line. That's what I'm concerned about. So quick pick, who wins? I've got Notre Dame 27-23 over the Fighting Elways. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are finally into the fourth quarter of the countdown. Up next, Notre Dame has started two quarterbacks already this season, and that's nothing new. I'll look at how much the quarterback carousel has spun in the Kelly era, and what the Irish coach says about playing more than one QB when the countdown comes back in two minutes. Well, that ever-revolving Notre Dame quarterback carousel is spinning once again as Ian Book is the new man under center, replacing Brandon Wimbush just three games into the season. So, how did we get here? Well, it turns out turnover has been a hallmark of quarterbacks under Brian Kelly, and I'm not talking about interceptions. 
Brian Kelly turns to Ian Book, hoping he can bring consistency and big plays to the passing game. In nine years, Brian Kelly has had seven different starting quarterbacks. Dane Christ, Tommy Reese, Everett Golson, Malik Zaire, Deshaun Kaiser, Brandon Wimbush, and now Ian Book. Some alarming facts from that lineup. Christ and Wimbush are the only two to start consecutive season openers. But Christ got pulled after just a half that second season. Notre Dame trailing South Florida 13 to nothing. Wimbush after three games. Their passing game, they need more productivity. Of the five QBs no longer at Notre Dame, Reese, the current quarterback's coach, is the only starter who didn't transfer or leave early. And only twice has the same man started under center for Kelly's Irish for an entire year. Reese's senior season in 2013 and Kaiser in 2016 before he left early for the NFL draft. So just how much does all that QB upheaval matter to a team's success? It's never seemed to bother Kelly. I'm not sure about crazy, but he's certainly gutsy. He's always shunned the adage that if you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterback. In fact, before the season, he told me having two QBs actually calmed him this year. We have two quarterbacks now that combined uh, have won 10 football games for us and uh, beat some quality opposition. So uh, you feel a little bit more relaxed. And while he went with Wimbush praising his skills. And Brandon has the ability to, to really break open the game. It was clear Book would always be an option. Well, his mindset is such that he comes to work every day knowing that I'd better be ready to step in for Notre Dame and help us win. He got that chance, and that leads us to this week. Book's explosive outing against Wake has many Irish fans excited and anointing him the starter. But Kelly, he's sticking to the same tune. We've prepared both quarterbacks. They're both ready to play. And the quarterback carousel just keeps spinning. Even if Book starts the rest of the season, that's no guarantee for next year. Second seasons have been tough on Kelly's Irish QBs. Just ask Brandon Wimbush for that. And no one can forget that there's this guy who made his debut last week. Phil Dracovic is right there waiting in the wings. The good news is Notre Dame has depth at quarterback. And as we're learning in college football, whether it's Alabama or take a look at the situation at Clemson, mm -hmm. which showed its face today, that's necessary in today's game of college football. So if both guys stick it out, that's not a bad thing. No, definitely not. If you have two quarterbacks, maybe you just have two quarterbacks. We're back with some of the pregame ceremonies here inside Notre Dame Stadium in two minutes on the countdown. marching band with our national anthem and then a flyover of four U.S. Navy F-18 Hornets from the Strike Fighter Squadron 213 known as the Black Lions. I'll tell you what, this crowd seemed a little quiet before. That, uh, that flyover will get them going. Uh, it should. That's it an should. electric atmosphere. Hopefully we can provide that when we come back next. Our Irish keys to the game. The X Factors, the game predictions. It's the Four Winds Casino. What to watch for in 90 seconds on the countdown. Here are the final results of this week's Lock Monday Auto Group Irish fan poll at WNU.com. We asked you, is Stanford now one of Notre Dame's biggest rivals? 60% of you say yes after the recent games in this series, while 40% are sticking with tradition and say no. Thank you for voting in the Lock Monday Auto Group Irish fan poll on WNDU.com.
We just got a second flyover here at the stadium. Now Mark Bree joins us for our Four Winds Casino. What to watch for? And we start with the Irish keys to the game, Mr. Wilcox. You've heard this from me before already. It was my key to the game for the Vanderbilt game. Play a complete game. And the reason why I'm repeating it is because Notre Dame hasn't done that yet. We saw what Stanford can do in the fourth quarter last week against Oregon. If the Irish are going to survive this one, they need to shut them out for all four quarters. Mark? My key to the game is the Irish, if they ever get in the red zone, they've got to convert those opportunities into touchdowns. Field goals, Justin Ewan, he's close to breaking the career points record here at Notre Dame. That's great, but Notre Dame needs touchdowns tonight to win. And I think that if they, they have to have them uh, score touchdowns in the red zone. Let's keep it real basic here. Turnovers. Remember, we talked about the last two years these two teams have played. The pick six by Kaiser, the Catholic Charities action last year in Palo Alto. The Irish have to be able to protect the pigskin tonight. Now the X Factors. Alex, who'd you go I'm with? I'm going with the guy who's recently out of the doghouse, Dexter Williams, making his season debut tonight. I actually chose this before we knew about oh, Jafar sure Armstrong. Just going to pat myself on the back a little bit there. Good call, Alex. I think Dexter Williams has a big game today, gives the offense the jolt they need to knock off Stanford. My X factor is the Irish fans. They are out in plenty tonight. Plenty of Stanford red as well, but if the fans show up today, I think that's a huge advantage for the Irish going into tonight's matchup. I'm going really complex here, Ian Book, <laughs> because if he plays well, the Irish can win, and if he doesn't play well, they're not going to. Now it's prediction time, and Alex, what would you decide? I think it's a really close one. They beat Michigan by seven. They beat Ball State by six. They beat Vanderbilt by five. Tonight it's going to be a four-point differential, 24-20, Notre Dame over Stanford. Now before the season, I predicted the Irish to go 10-2. and two. This is one of those games I predicted that they would lose this one. But I have a good feeling about this one after 56 points last week against Wake Forest. I think they go 28 this time, and they win 28 to 20. All month long, I've said that Notre Dame would not run the table. And on my podcast, Sports Yak, I picked Stanford over Notre Dame. And then yesterday, I read an article comparing Ian Book to Joe Montana. <laughs> well, I know Joe Montana. I stood next to Joe Montana at a Notre Dame USC game. And if Ian Book is Joe Montana, then the Irish are going to win. And with the 73 national championship team here to pay homage, they're going to do it 24-23. So, gentlemen, I say we leave and give it off to Mike Tirico and Doug Flutie. They've got the call on NBC next. Alex and I are back for postgame.